let's start talking about how you got there and, and Uber. At the, at the Christmas party for Uber this year, you turned to all the reporters in the room and tell them what you said. Um, I said thank you for my job. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did, which was really <laughs> lovely. We liked that because um, you like to we were egomaniacs. So, um, but you, when you got your job, you didn't think you, it was part of a really strange process, having covered it and stuff like that. You didn't think you got the job, correct? Is no, it was it was one of the most bizarre processes out there, and I was kind of the unknown third party. Right. Uh, and which I think you swore to figure out who the yes, unknown I did. Third I said it was. was right? I said it was a man who was not a white man. Um, who was a, a, a uh, person of? Am I, I don't what know. Do you think? I don't know what you yeah. are, but in any case, they were. I'm I had still, like I'm still figuring it out. I know, but you're <laughs> you're, you're Persian. Um, you, you said it was not someone you. It was. They gave me all kinds of clues, but I couldn't figure it out. But I had different parts of you and stuff like that. But I did figure you out. Um, eventually. 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 But you didn't think you had the job. No, it was. I mean, I was competing with these headliners, uh, legends of of business, Meg Jeff Whitman. Immelt, Meg Whitman. And I was just a guy in Seattle who was running Expedia in my uh, own nest there. Um, and, and, you know, the, 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 one of the advantages that, that I had was I loved my job. I loved what I was doing uh, at Expedia. And at first, it was a bit of a lark. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm happy where I am. I'm doing great. I actually talked with Daniel Eck, mm -hmm. who was the next person that you have on. I remember... Uh, conversation over drinks with Daniel and and Daniel's like since when is life about being happy like this is about doing something great like this mm -hmm. is an important company right. in your lives <laughs> you know and like you have to try this right uh, and so when they call me again I'm like you know what what the hell let's let's do this but I I I didn't take it seriously at first I didn't sell myself to the company no. because I wasn't interested in getting a job because I had a great job. I was interested in doing this if I was the right person for it. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't particularly like politicking and with all the board dynamics going on. I was just like, hey, this is me. I got my strengths. I got my weaknesses. If if I'm the right person for this role, I'm game. Uh, and I thought there's a very small chance of my getting in. And the one person who all along was like, you're going to get your you're, you're going to get it is said my wife. Mm -hmm. So she. She, uh, she and I bet five bucks, and she won. Right. Well, good. She should have bet more. Yeah, and you, 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 when you got it, when you found out you got it. Ariana Huffington called me. Yeah. And, and I was uh, uh, shopping for groceries, and she's like, Ariana, I'm sorry. Dara, I have good news and bad news. And usually, yeah. Dara, I have good news and bad news. Good news and bad, bad news. news. Yes. Wait, so there, there she is. I'm really bad sorry about how this. How are you? Yeah. And how are you? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And usually, I'm like the bad news first. So I'm like, give me the good news. She said, you have the job. Yeah. I'm like, well, what's the bad news? It's leaked already. <laughs> so it was in the, and I think you reported. I it. reported. Like, it, great. Yeah. 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 So it was a little awkward. I already had a job, and I got this new job, and we had to. I put our chairman, Barry Diller at the time, the Expedia chairman, in a really difficult position and he handled with aplomb and he was amazing and, and we are where we are now. So let's talk about where we are now. Let's talk about the past. When thinking about this job, you had a company that was toxic in a lot of ways, like a very toxic atmosphere. You had Susan had set off, Susan Fowler had set off. Yep. Thing. How did you imagine you were going to fix that? You had a founder <clears throat> who was making trouble and continued to make trouble while you were there and we'll talk about that. Yeah. But yeah. what, what did you, how did you think about when you first came there? So I, I, I split up, uh, I'm an engineer right. um, by training, and you, the way to take on complex problems is to split them into component parts. Uh, and for me, first off, and super important was the governance of the company. The governance of the company, you had Benchmark and Travis to some extent really battling each other, and it was a battle over the control of the company. Mm -hmm. So you had, um, people who were focused on control rather than success. Mm -hmm. And so one focus for me was solve the governance so that you don't have players solving for control, but just thinking about the success of the company. And I think we've, we've gotten there yeah. now. Second for me was uh, management and culture. Uh, augment the management team, bring in some of my own folks, Tony West, Barney Harford, looking for a CFO now. Uh, and also, re um, very quickly go after the culture of the company, restate what we think 
the norms and the culture of Uber should be. Mm -hmm. uh, we brought that, we kind of crowdsourced that from, from the, the company itself rather than it being kind of a top-down thing. And, and I think that's starting to work. And, and, you know, the one norm that we talk about all the time is do the right thing. Uh, and if we start doing the right thing and if we start acting differently, eventually the world will notice. And we're not going to be able to control when the world will notice. Eventually the world will notice because the truth comes out in everything, good or right. bad. And then the third was, uh, is looking, you know, after culture management is thinking about the business strategically, setting us up for an IPO, uh, and and really setting up the business so that we can be profitable over the long term. And completing the investments that you did. That yeah, you absolutely, absolutely. So when you were, let's talk about the, the culture, the toxic yeah. culture, and Travis, who you had to deal, he's on the board, he's sure. a big shareholder. Yeah. You got there, and I remember you, you, we had lunch, and, and I was like, he's going to do something bad to you. Like, just let me just tell you that. Um, and you're like, oh, Kara, don't be so negative. And I was like, I'm going to be. I'm going to, I'm right. Um, and so one of the things. Is this the part where you say that? I you're told right? you so. No, but yeah. I think you didn't, you, you, did you understand? Because I think you came, I was like, you're an adult. You didn't come from this culture. Did you, did you feel like you, hand, how did you, hand, how did you go into that? Because here's someone who was a hard driving, great success. Huge um, success. Huge yeah. success. But the methodology was flawed, deeply flawed. Sure, listen, it's... it's but how did you every, think about dealing with that? Um, I, my focus is on making the company succeed. I don't want to get into me versus someone else. If I'm completely pure about the success of the company and don't think about politics, et cetera, um, the rest, I believe, will take care of itself. And it's a little bit of this you know, innocent outlook on life, but it's like, it's worked for me. Right. So, uh, you right, gotta play initially, to get strengths. Initially, he then kicked your shins with the, with the board members. So, the so, so, so he did, but they're like two great board members. Right. You know, like, Ursula and John are great board members. I didn't like how it happened, right. but instead of like focusing on how it happened, and, and the fact is, Travis has a right to, you know, a, 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 a governmental right to bring on those two board members, so focus on that. Well, they're actually two great board members. Mm -hmm. So let me get to know them, and I've gone to know them, and let me use them to help me uh, build a company that is successful, but is also successful in the right way. And if I focus on that, the rest will take care of itself. So how did you, what is your relationship with him now? Because the, the founder relationship is important. I mean, obviously, it's, it's highly valued in Silicon Valley, probably too, it is. too valued in some ways. Sometimes. Um, sometimes. Yes, sometimes, sometimes not. I mean, every, every situation is different. Listen, the, the, I think that the founder relationship is complicated, and also, frankly, the former CEO relationship is complicated. Yeah. Um, I'm a former CEO of Expedia. I'm still on the board. Uh, Mark Okerstrom has taken over for me. My job is to get the hell out of the way. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and Mark has to make his mark on that company. Mark has to make his mark. And which means he's a new CEO, he's gonna do things differently, and in doing things differently, definitionally, it's like doing things differently from my choices. Mm -hmm. So I can't get too personal or offended about that. And I think with Travis, you know, early on, I was like, listen, I'm gonna need my space. And uh, he did respect that. And once we got rid of the control, the struggle for control, et cetera, my focus is on taking the company forward. And now he's kind of found his thing, and he can be an entrepreneur, and he can build something. So he's a board member, and just as I inform the entire board, I inform him, and we have construct constructed dialogues. But also, I am taking the company in a different direction, and I think he respects that. And I think ultimately, you know, whether the direction is the right one or the you, wrong you one will be. What's that? You consult with him a lot. Not a lot, right. um, but it's I consult with I consult with him the way that I consult with the board. Um, and it is a different direction that we're going in in terms of culture. The strategy for us is now broadened in terms of mobility, et cetera. I did bring in a big partner in SoftBank, and I'm very happy about that. So, uh, you know, do I consult with them? I consult with them just like I consult with the rest of the board. Okay. Let's talk about what you've been doing. Now, besides your delightful I'm sorry video, which is lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Delightful. I like Not it. Not really. I can't. Yeah. Say it thank anymore. you. That's what. Oh, I, yeah. You know. Is that was that irony? I never. No, uh, yeah. I just hate them. Um, so <laughs> w explain I, why you're doing that? Because I see why you're doing it. Yeah. I, you know. Well, we're doing it because um, it was very important for we thought that the that our consumers and our target base 
to know that this is a new Uber and we're turning over a new leaf. Um, I'm really looking forward to get the heck off TV very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, but the fact is that we are a different kind of company and our values are different. And the fact that people had a negative viewpoint of the Uber of two, three years ago was hurting our brand and hurting our business. And we've got to reverse that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we are putting money in marketing. It's a message that I think is going to resonate and we're going to transition into the product itself and some of the steps that we're taking on the product side on safety, et cetera, really fundamentally reimagining the product and improving your product in a way that I think is pretty responsible. So let's talk about that product. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the core product. Mm -hmm. You have two components, obviously the customers and the drivers. Yeah. You've just recently, you've, your driver issues still continue to be something you have to deal with. Talk about that. I think long term, because, sure, yeah. Yeah, so talk about that issue. Because last time when Travis was here on the stage, I'm sorry yeah. to mention, he actually, when I asked about self-driving, he actually told the truth. He's like, the problem with Uber's business model is the guy sitting in the front seat, we gotta get rid of him, and then it's all gravy for us. Like, once we get rid of him, it's a great business. Which I was like, thank you, so, God, So, so th that. this is something I fundamentally disagree <laughs> yeah, with. Okay, all right. Uh, the, the face of Uber is the person sitting in the front seat, mostly guys. I actually would like to have more women sitting in the front seat as well, because it's a great form of employment. You know, you can, you can be your own boss and you don't need to work full time. Uh, that is the face of Uber, right? It's, it's we build a delightful app, you can get in and get out, but ultimately the time that you spend with our service is really the time that you spend with our driver partners. So we have launched actually one of the first product ones that we made is launching a new driver app. It was built in concert with the drivers. We actually consulted them. They were involved in, in building out the app. Uh, and we're introducing a lot of features now, now that... Uh, there's a lot of still disgruntlement. They don't feel like they're paid enough, that they're getting... You know, they're, I, I get email every day. From so we have three that. million driver partners around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are some that are disgruntled. All of them, I think, want to make more money. But fundamentally, they get to be their own bosses and they get to work on their own terms. In general, I think driver earnings are going up. Uh, and we have in increased time and distance in certain places. Uh, and well, what's you know, the we've challenge then with them if they feel, you know, the push pull of the system not giving them what they need. They obviously don't have benefits and other things that. Well, listen. In, in Europe, we rolled out a an insurance feature with AXA where the driver partners actually do get benefits if they have accidents. They have insurance. They got maternity, paternity benefits, etc. So we are actually. We have to build a great service, and I think one of the fundamental growth blockers that we have are, are we going to be able to have enough, enough driver, driver partners right, and exactly. recruit enough driver partners long term? So one is we're working on the product very, very actively. Two is we are going to work on earnings and maximizing earnings as long as it doesn't fundamentally hurt the price of the product, and that's tough. Mm -hmm. So for example, pool is a product and we're investing hundreds of millions of dollars in pool in order to get two people into a car. Those two people can pay a much, much lower rate and the driver doesn't have to take the brunt of, uh, brunt of that. And then we are also looking at benefits. You know, there's this, as you think about the gig economy and independent workers, et cetera, there's this, you know, independent workers, there's a second class citizen that all of a sudden doesn't get access to benefits, healthcare, et cetera, just because they've chosen to work for themselves versus, uh, you know, outsour outsource their career to, to a company. I think when you think about the future of work, work is going to be much less about a company mm -hmm. um, than it is going to be about the work itself. Mm -hmm. And so part of what I want to do, we want to do it at Uber, is to think about the independent workers not being in second class and Can we economically build out benefits packages and insurance so that this this can be a safer way of living, while at the same time being your own is boss. Is the competition for drivers starting to get rougher? We've um, number of times. Rougher. Listen, it's it's. I think that the competition for drivers is uh, a bigger competition within the economic context because the economy is getting better, and as you know, unemployment rate is at an all-time low. So. We have to compete against the economy for drivers. It's not necessarily us versus Lyft, et cetera. It's our sourcing just more drivers to come onto the platform. And we have to make it more attractive 
because their alternatives are becoming more attractive. So still talking about the core business, I noticed just in San Francisco, the price is going up quite a bit. Like I've no yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Talk right. about it, because then I, and I, now I'm like, eh, I think I'll just walk, or I think I'll just, it's not quite as, like, wow, it's just Take a bike. No, so I'm not taking one of those scooters. Those or things are not scooters, e-bikes. They're, they're awesome. I'm not taking any of those things. So I do think time, time and distance has, has come up. Right. Which um, one did you just buy? You bought one of those bike things. Uh, we bought Jump, Jump which right. are, which are yes. e-bikes. Yeah. And a very, very important push for us is to innovate to lower costs. In other words, not just take the rates down in order to lower costs, but actually use innovation to lower the cost of getting from point A to B. And examples of our pool again, mm -hmm. and we've exp we have uh, launched a new product, which is called Express Pool, where... You meet uh, at a certain point. You meet at a certain point. You may wait. So you may walk a, a block or two, and you may get dropped off a block or two from where you're going. It allows us to match much, much more efficiently and allows the, the ride to take less turns. Right. So the ride itself becomes much more efficient. And then we are thinking about alternative forms of transport. If you look at jump, jump. the average uh, length of a trip at jump is 2.6 miles. That is 30 to 40% of our trips in San Francisco are 2.6 miles or less. Mm -hmm. uh, jump is much, much cheaper than taking an UberX. And to some extent it's like, hey, let's cannibalize ourselves, let's create a cheaper form of transportation from a, from A to B, and for you to come to Uber and Uber not just being about about cars, and Uber not being about what the best solution for us is, but really being about the best solution. So for bikes, you. scooters. Uh, bikes, perhaps scooters. Um, I want to get the bus network on. I want to get the BART or the Metro, etc., onto Uber. So any way for you to get from point A to B. Wait, you want to start your own BART? No. No, no, no. We we want to. Uh, we're not going to go vertical everywhere. Just like Amazon sells third-party goods, right. we are going to also offer third-party transportation services. Mm -hmm. So we want to kind of be the Amazon for transportation, uh, and we want to offer the BART as a, an alternative. There's a company called Masabi that uh, is, is um, connecting Metro, et cetera, into, an, uh, into the payment system. So we want you to be able to like say, should I take the BART? Should I take a bike? Should I take an Uber? All of it to be real-time information, all of it to be optimized for you, and all of it to be done with the push of a button. So any transportation. Any transportation, so, totally frictionless, real-time. And then Uber real -time. Eats is also a growing business for you all. Eats is um, an exploding business in a good way. Uh, it's now at a $6 billion bookings run rate, mm -hmm. uh, growing over 200%. Uh, I think we are going to be the largest uh, delivery. food delivery business uh, in the world, ex-China. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is, it, it's taking advantage of our customer base, it's taking advantage of our brand, but also kind of we create a startup within, within the company that can use all of our local infrastructure in all the cities uh, that we're in. And, you know, Eats is in only 250 cities on a global basis, and they got another 350 to go in order to catch up to our rise so, business. So that, that's a promising business. These other ones are the ones you're looking for growth because because you, you all need to keep that fact. Yeah, listen, it's, it's the, the way I think about growth is there's a core rise business which is still growing, very, very healthy. What is We've the growth got, rate of that now? Um, overall, the growth rate of our business uh, this last quarter, the revenue growth was 67%. Um, the rise business we haven't disclosed, but you know, it's, it's got to be at healthy rates in order for the overall business to be growing at 67% uh, on, a, on a revenue basis. Um, so you got the rides business, eats a scaling. Uh, we've got businesses like uh, freight that are going to be bigger businesses three to five years from now. And this concept of Uber as a platform for us mm -hmm. is something I think that's very, so, very exciting kind of five to 10 years from now. What about self-driving? Nobody thinks you're staying in self-driving. Uh, I don't. I do think we're staying in self-driving. So How? I don't know about nobody. Listen, we're for the first thing that we've got to do is we have this incredible tragedy, uh, and we've got to get back on the road. But we have to be satisfied, absolutely satisfied, that we're getting back on the road in the safest manner possible. That's my focus right now, uh, and we're working with the team to do so. And we've got a panel of outside experts, former so chair of NTSB. Closed? Yeah, yeah. We closed Phoenix, um, but we will get back on the road over the summer. Uh, and, you know, I actually think that 
this focus on really, really getting back on the road in as safe a manner as possible. Ultimately, long term is, you know, it's this is a difficult circumstance for everyone involved. You know, first the victim and the victim's family, but this is going to make us a better company. And I think when I think about autonomous, we want to play in it. The technology that we're building is incredible. Ultimately, I think that we're not going to look to uh, own the technology for ourselves and we'll license it to third parties. We'll work with OEMs, et cetera. I think autonomous is, is kind of a horizontal technology that should be available to everybody. So that is something that we will look to right. do. We will look to partner. Do you still look at it as an existential threat to your business? Because a lot of that's how Travis thought about it. I know it, we it talked it's about existential it. if we don't have access to the technology. Right. So why but, do you have to make it? What is well, listen, we have to have access to it. And I think there are going to be many autonomous players. And that's right. why I think as a principle, we will license out our own technology. And then we'll look to build around other autonomous technology as well. We're neutral. We're, you know, we're a network company. So if GM builds autonomous technology, you know, I'd welcome Waymo to, to put cars into our network as well. Right. We want to be to totally neutral. How is your relationship with Waymo now? Getting better. Listen, yeah. I've, I've uh, you know, it's, it's, you build relationships slowly but surely. Right. I had a long relationship with Google, and I think we have a trust level. And, you know, we're having discussions with Waymo. If something happens, great. If not, discussions you know, we can live what? with that too. Precisely. Uh, about putting them onto our network. Right. I mean, they're they're an incredible technology provider out there. They're they're building, you know, they're serious about autonomous. And to the extent that that technology could show up on the network, I think it'd be a good thing. Now it's up to them whether they want to do it or not. Right. And wh what are you using to convince them to do so? That this is economics. That they need to be near the. It's, it's, I think that if you're building the autonomous for you to be able to put your cars to have the highest utilization rate. Um, because it is ultimately going to be autonomous will be shared. That's fundamental to the technology. If it's shared, you want to have the highest utilization rate possible and owning or being a part of the largest ride sharing network on a global basis will enable you to get a highest utilization out of your autonomous cars. Right. And ultimately, I don't think it's going to be black and white. I think that our network is going to be a hybrid network for a long time. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's this kind of this, the drama of kind of our machines going to replace humans. You yes. Know, mach yes. No, machines augment humans. The magic is like machines and humans together are the thing that's better. You see it in manufacturing, car manufacturing. You saw, you know, Facebook even talk about when they're looking for hate speech, it's a combination of humans and computers. Mm -hmm. Computers can't do it alone. Humans can't scale. Machines so you and are humans committed are to better. staying in the autonomous. Yeah, and, and ultimately our network is going to be a machine network and a human network together. And I think that's a unique magic that Uber can bring. What about these other things that you were going into? Uh, the, the vertical lift and takeoff. Jeff Holden just left. He was doing... Well, Jeff brought in Eric to, to run Elevate. And, and I think Eric is an amazing executive to, to run Elevate. And you know, for us, it is about defining the future of mobility for cities. And, if three, and the issue, the fundamental issue, is that 50% of the world's population lives in cities now. It's going to two thirds of the world population. The infrastructure, the, the transportation infrastructure of cities cannot keep up with that kind of growth. So one is you got to be smarter, which goes to sharing cars, getting away from car ownership, which is pool. Second is you need to build out alternative forms of transport, not just cars, which is the bikes that we're getting into. And the third is just like residential is gone, three dimensional skyscrapers and commercials gone three dimensions, you're going to have to build a third dimension in terms of transportation. And Elevate for us is the third dimension that we're taking a big bet on, but it's a long-term bet, and we're doing it with a number of partners okay. out there. All right, last couple questions, and then we'll get to the audience. Um, so SoftBank, a lot of people feel that you're just going to carve up the world, that, that, with, that, you, that you did, you're getting rid of, you got rid of China, that you'll do that in other markets. Do you we, see that so happening? We, we sold in Southeast Asia. Right. Um, we are in a position to win in every market that we're in. Uh, and part of the reason why we sold in Southeast Asia is, one, we believe in Grab and Anthony, who runs that business. But we wanted to have enough dry powder to win everywhere we're in. So and I in think India, we're in that position. You India, India Middle East, uh, Africa, et cetera, we are going to be, I believe, the winning player in those markets, and we're going to control our own destiny. Because in a lot of ways, uh, uh, 
the investment Yahoo made in China was what made it. Like, and right now you're. I'm hoping investment. that won't be the path to my success. Right. <laughs> All right. Last question: When are you going public? 2019, uh, second sure. half of 2019. Right. And we're on track. I need a CFO though. You need a lot. You need some women executives. That would be kind of nice. That would be definitely kind of nice. And? Working on it. Working on it. It's Results, on, 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 on a serious note. Um, I am, you know, to we talk about on recruiting, etc. In order to build a diverse, in order to build a diverse team, you got to build a diverse slate. Right. And that takes time. Like it's not you can say it, but it actually takes time to find the talent out there and to find diverse talent out there. And if I'm going to tell my execs to do it, I've got to do it myself. Right. And so it is taking time. I don't know whether it will be a woman or a man, um, but I'm going to make damn sure I look at both. Yeah, this particular company could use some women executives. I'm sorry. I agree, and, and if we can do it, we'll make it happen. So questions from the audience, right here. Hi, um, Sid. Right, well, yes, how are, you? Hi. how are you? Sid Wilson, President and CEO for the Hispanic Association on Corporate Responsibility in Washington D.C. Um, you've had some um, some pretty high profile. Um, uh, diverse hires. Uh, Tony West is your general counsel. Uh, you just hired Bo Young Lee as your first chief diversity He's officer, great. which yeah. is great. Uh, and uh, and I know uh, uh, um, uh, Bozoma St. John's as your chief marketing officer. Um, she's, my, my, yeah. she's not CMO, but go ahead. Oh, okay. I'm like, brand okay. officer, yeah. Oh, okay. Chief brand officer, sorry. Yes. Um, my, my question is, is that um, you, you know, you hear about a lot of the Silicon Valley CEOs who talk to other CEOs when it comes to issues of diversity and inclusion, what what are you hearing when you talk to your fellow colleagues who are the CEOs of the other Silicon Valley companies about what you mentioned is the challenges that you're finding? Because this morning I asked the same question of Randall Stevenson at AT&T who, who don't, they don't seem to have a problem finding diverse talent, and yet you hear uh, Silicon Valley companies and CEOs mentioning that they're finding challenges finding people of color uh, that can serve in these high-ranking positions, and you found some. Uh, so yep. what you know? But what's been your your observations? So um, I don't have a lot of time to talk to other CEOs in Silicon Valley right now. Just uh, honest answer, uh, and and it goes to two things. One is building a diverse slate so that you you're looking at all kinds of talent. Uh, both in terms of underrepresented minorities and women as well. You just have to put in the work. I do think that there's too much of a focus on hiring uh, and not enough of a focus on development. I'm a huge believer in talent development. If all you're doing is hiring, then it's like you're trading you know, with each other. You're not actually building talent within these companies. Development takes time. And one of the reasons why I'm really excited to have Bo on the team is like, I'm committed to developing diverse talent at this company. Not going to happen overnight. Going to take five to seven years. But then I think that we've succeeded if we build some real stars of this company over a period of time. Okay. okay. Thanks. Sure. Let's keep questions short because we only have a short amount of time because we do have a drone thing going on. So I can't ask three questions? Okay. No. Hey, Dara. Jason Delray from Recode. Hey. Um, question about Uber Eats. Um, you talked about... Um, believing you'll be the number one food delivery company outside of, uh, with the exception of China. I think uh, we, we are. You think you are? Um, well, yeah, globally. What is the long-term differentiation of that business to consumers? Is it the partner, is it the partner restaurants? Is it just scale? Um, and the second part of that is, curious in the U.S. if you think you'll need um, any acquisition of other brands in the space to strengthen your, your hold here. I, I think that the magic that we have is the hardcore execution and getting the delivery in under 35 minutes and getting it under 35 minutes every single time. Um, to move that success factor from like 98% to 99% is incredibly difficult, but I think we have a team that is just really driven to making us as perfect and as fast as possible. And I think it's that simple. And I don't see anyone else as dedicated to just being fast every single time. That's a secret. It seems simple, but it's really hard to execute on. And the second, second question was just acquisitions in the space. Um, uh, I think we will be opportunistic. I've done lots of acquisitions in the past. We don't need an acquisition. But listen, this is a big space. Uh, there's a lot of growth in it. I think that delivery is going to be a much, much bigger portion of kind of 
eating and, and consumption going forward, uh, plan number one is organic and we'll be opportunistic if there are acquisitions out there. We just don't need to do it. Okay, quick question. We gotta get... Hey, Dark, congratulations. Uh, Chris you. Pfeiffer, CEO of Hop. Um, as long as we have humans that are driving, uh, I'm just curious because a lot of the safety measures seem to be aimed at the rider, and I'm just curious what you're doing for the driver now that I've got family members and friends that are drivers. Yeah, so we are, uh, today, for example, we rolled out a 911 emergency button for riders. We're doing the same thing for drivers as well. Uh, and I think that in general, um, we are trying to get much better at uh, identifying and rating our community, and that includes both riders and drivers, and flagging unsafe riders just as we flag unsafe drivers as well. Um, we really are, I believe that it's a competitive differentiation if we make Uber the safest ride sharing platform on earth for both riders and drivers. I'm sorry, we can't get to the last question. I apologize. Uh, Derek, I have one more question. What's the thing that scares you the most right now as CEO? Um, what scares me the most is that the company is too dependent on me making decisions. Um, it's it's when, when a decision has to come to me, it's a failure because then the team doesn't know what to do. Uh, I haven't spent enough time on kind of putting my team together. I've spent a little too much time doing uh, and I got to get the team and that team has to get aligned so hopefully they can they can just fly without me. All right, Dara Khosrowshahi, thank you. Thank you.